The new iPhone can connect to satellites. Why SLS didn't launch and when it might. Growing rice in space and another incredible image from James Webb. All that and more in this week's episode of Space Bites. Hi everyone, I'm Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today. I've been a space and astronomy news journalist for over 20 years. This is our Space Bites, short, bite-sized information about space and astronomy news that happened this week. All right, let's get into the stories. The Tarantula Nebula by James Webb. Wow. I like I think this is probably my favorite picture that has come out of the James Webb Space Telescope so far. This is just amazing. This is an image of the Tarantula Nebula, which is a star forming region in the Large Magellanic Cloud. So it's in another galaxy. And it is ludicrously big. Like when you think about the Orion Nebula, it's relatively nearby. This one is so much bigger with so much more star formation compared to what they have even just in the Orion Nebula. And this image was originally taken as part of that first set of science images that James Webb did. And then I guess the people who were working with the images looked through this as well as all of the other images and decided that they had other cool images to share. And so they held on to this one and we just got it this week. Now you can go and download a much higher resolution version. This one that is 14,000 pixels by 8,000 pixels. So so much bigger. And what's really cool about James Webb, of course, is that it has this infrared view, it can see cooler objects, it can peer through the gas and dust that surrounds these star forming nebulae. And so in this image, there are 1000s of stars that have never been seen before they were hidden by the nebula. And now thanks to James Webb, we're able to see them. But still, it's a beautiful image. It's a scientifically interesting image. Again, I think it's one of the best images that James Webb has produced so far. Another delay for SLS. Hopefully, if all goes well, it will launch September 3rd as late as September 5th. But you know, like, if I was a betting man, I would guess that we're going to have to wait probably until October. There's going to be some other issues they're going to need to sort out and just another month just to really double check and fix everything will be great. Like, I'm not Nostradamus, but obviously I did call that the SLS was going to be delayed and then the SLS was going to be delayed again and it was and that wasn't like me being able to see the future. That is just the reality of trying to deal with hydrogen as a fuel It's the lightest element in the universe has teeny tiny atoms, and it wants to leak out of every single pressure vessel that you try to do. And this is what NASA is dealing with. They found a leak in the fuel feed line of their quick disconnect. And this is an umbilical that connects the fueling system to the SLS. And there was some kind of leak coming out of the system. So they decided to stop the countdown and try to trace the source of the leak. They're going to keep working on this leak while the rocket is on the pad, but they've got a bit of a hard deadline. Now NASA is on a bit of a timeline because of a system on board SLS called the FTS, the flight termination system. And this system has been certified for a certain time period and NASA is going to run out the clock on that certification. And then they have to essentially recharge the batteries on board the FTS. And the only way to do that is to roll the SLS back to the vehicle assembly building and be able to access it from there. And so they're hoping that they'll be able to get a waiver so they don't have to recertify this the FTS system and that they can just continue on with their scheduled launch for the 23rd. So if they do get permission, then they'll do some more test fueling on the 17th. And if that works well, then another launch window opens up on the 23rd, and then another one on the 27th. If they don't get permission, they're gonna have to roll the rocket back to the vehicle assembly building, do a more significant upgrade, swap out the batteries, and they probably won't be able to fly in October. So at this point, I'm not going to make any more predictions. I mean, they've traced down a couple of minor problems remaining. I like their chances to fly later on in September, but I'll keep you posted. 
And of course, just before we started recording this episode, we got news that SpaceX Starship just did a hot fire with probably six of its Raptor 2 engines all at the same time. And so we are getting closer and closer to a Starship launch. Remember, Elon Musk said it'll launch sometime within the next month to 12 months. So it could be right around the corner or we could be waiting another year. The new iPhone will talk to satellites. This week, Apple did their big new product announcement, all of the new iPhones, and we got a lot of updates about what they're planning to do. Very little of it has anything to do with space, so my eyes just glazed over. But one thing did catch my eye, and that is that the new iPhone 14 is gonna have satellite connectivity, sort of. The way it's gonna work is on the iPhones, they have an emergency mode that you can press if you get into trouble. And as long as you're in cell phone range, then you emergency services will be alerted and they'll come and help you out. Well, with the new iPhone 14, it's going to go to space, which is kind of cool. Now, they're gonna be using the Global Star satellite network and the connectivity is gonna be fairly limited. So if you get into some kind of accident and you fall and you press the emergency SOS button, as long as you have a clear view to the sky, your phone will be able to communicate with one of the satellites, alert emergency services, and they'll be able to come and help you out. It'll take a little longer if you're under foliage, perhaps you've fallen down a ravine or something, but still, it should still work as long as you're outside. Behind the scenes, the signals are going up to the Global Star Network, and these are a series of satellites that are orbiting at about 1,400 kilometers, so much higher than the Starlink satellites. Now, speaking of Starlink, of course, last week we talked about how Starlink and T-Mobile are gonna be allowing your phone to be able to connect to the satellite network. And in the case of Starlink, you're gonna be able to make phone calls, send text messages, from anywhere in the United States, and I guess eventually wherever Starlink has coverage around the world. And the plan is that the Starlink satellites are gonna work with really any mobile phone, while the Apple version obviously will only work with the Apple 14. They've got special hardware on board to be able to send this message out to satellites. And we also learned that Huawei is going to be offering a similar service on a Chinese satellite network. And so now you've got like three different devices, families are gonna be able to connect to the internet. You can see where this is going, that at some point in the near or far future, you're gonna have a mobile phone that will be able to connect high speed, to the internet from anywhere on earth. That sounds pretty great. Growing rice in space. We got news this week that the Chinese astronauts, Taikonauts on board the Tiangong space station were able to successfully grow rice in space. Now growing vegetables in space is nothing new. The International Space Station has a greenhouse on board where astronauts can grow various leafy greens, mustards, even some flowers, and they're able to add these to their meals to spice up and maybe make their meals less bland and in a package. And they've learned what it takes to actually grow vegetables in space. On the Chinese space station, they decided to try growing rice. And they did two varieties of rice, a sort of standard rice and then a dwarf variety. And they actually started growing them back in July. And we got the news that they the test has been successful. The standard variety has grown about 29 centimeters, while the dwarf variety has just grown about five centimeters. But actually, that is the normal amount that you can expect for growth of these varieties of rice, even if they were on Earth. In addition to learning to grow vegetables in space, the purpose of this is to see what kinds of genetic variations happen to rice while it's grown in space. So they're going to be bringing the new crop back down to earth and they're going to scan the genetic code very carefully to see what kinds of mutations have happened, possibly due to being in microgravity, possibly due to increased amounts of radiation, and that will help understand if it's a sustainable way of growing crops into the future. 
And this isn't the first time that rice has been grown in space. Actually, some Indonesian students designed an experiment on the International Space Station back in 2016 to grow rice, and they were able to successfully do it as well. So more examples of food being grown in space. And that's how we're going to get to that future greenhouses in orbit. Green sand on Mars. When NASA chose the landing site for the Perseverance rover, they picked Jezero Crater. And they did that for a very special reason, because this is one of the places on Mars that most clearly had water for long periods of time. It was an impact crater, but it then filled up with water and probably was wet for a long period of time. You can see rivers leading in and out of the crater. And so there's probably sedimentary channels and all kinds of material that would indicate there was water there for a long time. Now, when Perseverance arrived at Jezero Crater, it did find evidence that yes, indeed, there was water here. It found sedimentary rocks down at the bottom of the crater, places where you would expect the water had been sitting for a long time and material had collected out and piled up over long periods of time. But on the edges of the crater, it found examples of volcanism. And one specific kind of rock tells a really interesting story. So it found these green rocks, which we now know are olivine. And this is a mineral that's found on Earth. It is a kind of volcanic rock. And it happens when there's a lot of trapped gases inside the lava as it is being ejected from the volcano. Over time, as the gases work their way out, the lava switches to a more fluid, more rocky kind of lava, but the the one that produces this olivine is actually very explosive. And what it tells you is that there was a lot of water nearby water in mixed in with the lava water had penetrated into the rock down to the area where it was mixing with the lava and then it was being exploded out onto the surface. So again, more evidence that Mars is more complicated than we thought, but also clearly had water for longer periods than we thought. Rocket Lab tests an engine that went to space. Now we reported several weeks ago that Rocket Lab was able to successfully catch one of the booster rockets from a recent Electron rocket launch. Well, they didn't quite catch it. Now the rocket came back to Earth with a parachute and then a helicopter went out and caught the rocket as it was falling. And they caught it successfully, but then they weren't able to hold on to it and they ultimately had to drop the rocket into the ocean. They went, they fished the rocket out of the ocean, cleaned it up. And this week we learned they've been doing a bunch of tests on this rocket engine, and they were able to prove that it still works fine. They fired it for the same length of time it would take for this rocket to carry a payload up to orbit, and it worked fine. Now, I don't know if they're actually going to reuse this specific booster, but it shows that the technique works. You can catch these boosters with a helicopter, you can fly them back to the facility, you can fire them again, and carry another payload to orbit. And that should be able to reduce costs and make spaceflight even more inexpensive. NASA's buying some moonwalk spacesuits. NASA is gearing up for their return to the moon. Of course, we're going to see the Artemis one mission launch any day now with SLS. And then after that, we see Artemis two where they work on the deep space gateway. And then Artemis three is when humans return to the moon. But they're going to want to go outside, they're going to go for a walk. And right now, NASA has no spacesuits capable of supporting humans out on the surface of the moon. Now you can't go back to the original Apollo era suits, they're all in museums and are degraded and use old technology. So NASA has gone to find a new provider. And they've gone with Axiom to develop the spacesuits. You might be familiar with Axiom. They're the group that sent that first private tourist trip up to the International Space Station. They're building a private space module that's going to go on to the International Space Station, and they are building spacesuits. And so they demonstrated that they have the capability to build spacesuits for the lunar mission. NASA is paying them an initial fee of 228 million, but it could end up being billions to do all of the spacesuits and the spacesuits have to work for the Artemis three mission, but then also continue to work through till about 2034. So there's like when you think about all the pieces of the puzzle coming together to make a mission like this work, just like one of these, like, 
building spacesuits for the surface of the moon, the mind boggles at all of the pieces that have to come together. So this is another one that is in development. If you want more details on any of the stories talked about today, all the links are in the description. And if you want even more space news, subscribe to my weekly email newsletter. This goes out every Friday, has no ads, I write every word, has all the important space and astronomy news delivered directly to your inbox. Just go to universetoday.com slash newsletter to sign up. And if you prefer an audio version, all of the videos are available in a handy audio podcast format. This week, we've started up our Meet the Team series on the podcast where you can learn behind the scenes about the people who work on Universe Today with me. And this week, we feature Nancy Graziano, who is the executive producer of the Weekly Space Hangout and is present during all of the live streams that we do and is really the cat herder in chief of the Universe Today and the Weekly Space Hangout and CosmoQuest, etc. So you're going to want to check out that interview. And if you want to discuss the latest news as well as other space related topics, join our Discord server. There we hold a discussion club where you can join the discussion every Wednesday with me and Anton, my producer. The links are in the description. Thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. And a special thanks to Josh Schultz and Andrew M. Gross, who support us at the Master of the Universe level. Everyone's support means the universe to us. All right, those were all the stories this week. We'll see you next week.